Hello and welcome to another episode of Nathan Builds Robots. Today I'm going to be taking my first step into my journey of resin 3D printing. Now I've had a couple offers before to feature resin printers on my channel, but I declined every time because they just wanted to send me the printer and there's so much support equipment that you have to buy. And I was like, come on guys, you got to send me more than just the printer, otherwise I'm going to be spending more on materials than what you're providing for me. Creality stepped up and they gave me the printer as well as the wash and cure station and two bottles of resin. So I figured that was enough for me to get started. You're only going to want to do this in a well ventilated space. So you can see I've got this nice little room fan up here. You don't want to be doing this in your living room or somewhere where a child or pet could get into this stuff because it is toxic and hazardous to your health. Also you'll want to have some special waste bins to deal with contaminated materials. Once you've got your support infrastructure set up and you've found a safe place to run your resin 3D printer, now you can think about buying one. This Halo Mage is supposed to be a pretty high-end model, so we'll check it out and uh, see how it works today. I'll be using this resin that Creality supplied. This is their high-speed resin. The difference is that it's really runny. It's almost like, like water. You can hear it. Other resins are more viscous, like syrupy. One of these jugs with one kilogram of resin only costs about $10. Now the other thing that you're gonna have to worry about is with isopropyl alcohol, this stuff's flammable. So you wanna be prepared in case there's any kind of emergency or fire. I've got a fire extinguisher here, as well as a smoke alarm. It's better to be over prepared for this kind of stuff because if you have a static buildup and you shock something and that lights a fire, you're gonna to wanna to be able to put that out immediately. You're also gonna need paper towels to clean up any minor spills but your goal with this stuff should always be to prevent spillage in the first place. So just be very careful when you're pouring and handling filament. All right, with all that safety stuff out of the way, I think we're ready to get started with this printer. So let's take a closer look and check out some of its features. So this is the Creality Halot Mage. It's a nice big printer that can print super fast, apparently. We've got an 8K screen, and it's a 220 by 120 by 230 millimeter build area. So that's essentially like you have an Ender 3 build platform, but you cut it in half and uh, it's roughly the same height. Some of the convenience features that you've got on this printer is this uh, one-handed lift lid. Also in here, you've got an automatic resin fill tank. So if I go to settings, print settings, and Z-axis movement, I can uh, move this upwards. So there we go. That thing moves fast. It's got a really wobbly lead screw. Hopefully that doesn't affect the print. Oh, jeez. Oh my gosh. Okay, well, all right. Um, back to zero. That's not what I want. Gosh, this thing's making me nervous. It moves really fast. So, uh, leveling. Oh, wow. <laughs> It actually broke itself there. So uh, it broke the uh, stepper motor free from the lead screw there by ramming into the bottom. So I'm gonna have to fix that. All right, well, this is a good opportunity to take a look inside of a resin printer anyways. So let's see what we've got in here. So it looks like we've got our power supply and a big old stepper motor. And it looks like this stepper motor actually has an encoder built onto the back. So I think it's got closed loop stepper control. That's pretty neat. All right, so here's our problem. When I'm rotating this, uh, this coupler, it's turning the stepper motor, but it's not turning the lead screw. All right, so now we've got that coupler so that the lead screw is actually in there, and we'll tighten it up. It looks like we've got a small control board here and then a little uh, light cover to make sure that you don't have ultraviolet light leaking out. Then right up against the top surface, you're going to have an LCD screen, and uh, that's about it. It's really simple and basic down here. I don't think I've ever done a review of a Creality product where I didn't have to fix something on it, so this is just par for the course. All right, let's try this again. Back to zero. So now I can remove this piece of uh, foam and I'm going to take the print tray out. This thing's like a drum. It's just some plastic material that's stretched across the, uh, the bottom here. I'm just kind of 
getting any little pieces of dust off of it. That's a pretty fun noise though. I'm gonna use some Kim wipes to try and wipe this up a little bit, just to get rid of any little bits of dust. I've also got this sheet, so if I ever needed to replace this uh, vat material, I think I've got an extra one here. Now you definitely don't want to get any resin on this little screen here. And then I think I put this calibration card down, then I loosen up these four screws. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow this build surface to float a little bit. You can see it can move around a little now. So when I tell this to go to z oh my goodness, I'm scared. Tell it to go to zero. Okay. Now it's flat against the build surface. And I think I just tighten up these screws now. So now we're gonna go back to zero. And then I'll put this piece of paper away with my extra FEP sheet. And we'll save that for later. Apparently you're supposed to change that sheet out, this little uh, membrane here, every 200 hours. All right, so we'll just make sure everything's nice and clean. Every time you put this back in place, you kind of have to push this switch, which lowers the fill drain port down into position. So you just kind of help that along in there and then thread these screws in. Now I'm gonna do my first mod here yeah i heard someone else complaining about this and i tend to agree with them when you put the dish in place and you're trying to thread these into position it's just kind of more difficult than it needs to be so what i'm going to do is i'm going to put a little chamfer on those threaded holes and that's going to help guide the bolts into these holes I'm getting a little lightheaded here. It might be nice to have a little duster when you're working on this stuff. But anyways, we'll see if that helps with our little issue with the threading. Um, so again, we'll set this down, push this little feeder spout into place, and then see if it's any easier to thread those in. And yep, it's much easier. So there you go, maybe that's a little improvement Creality can include on their later editions of this machine. This was a really early model of the printer, so they may have done some improvements to this already, but I'm gonna send all of these improvements to Creality to see if they can just make their products a little bit better. So I think we're ready to get started here. Now sticking out the back, kind of on the left side, right behind this little module, it'll draw resin through that tube and put it into the build area. There's no safety seal or anything, so as soon as you take this lid off, you're dealing with the liquid resin. And actually, I can smell this stuff too. It's, it smells kind of gross. We'll dip that in there, and I'm going to turn the ventilation fan on. You can also wear a respirator. Well, I'm going to go ahead and press the in button, and I think that should draw the, uh, the resin out of the jar and into our print area. So there you go. That's pretty sweet. Also, I'm going to make a custom cap for this thing. I'm just going to drill out a hole in the middle here. Now I'm going to close this. I plugged in our provided USB stick, but let's just go ahead and print the cardio. Now I can unplug the USB drive. So let's hit start. First resin print. So the whole thing's going to be dipped into the water. Hopefully there's no bubbles trapped under there. Oh, wow. You can hear that thumping noise. That's it pulling loose every every time. My gosh. I'm just gonna turn the, uh, the vent off for a second so you can hear it. That's crazy. So you've got that drum surface at the bottom, but it should kind of tent up and then come detached. And then the final piece comes loose and it just kind of pops and snaps off. So crazy, I didn't think Resin printing would be this loud. All right, now it's getting a little quieter. Hopefully the lack of noise doesn't mean it's broken. Now this uh, Halo Mage has a ventilation system. I've got it hooked up to this white tube 
that's exhausting up here. Right next to my ventilation fan, so we're just taking all of the nasty smelling chemicals and blowing them out of the office. The print's almost done. There it is. So if we look down at the menu, it says print complete. Hit OK. All right, so the nice thing about this Halo Mage is we can just lift this up, and here is our part. All I have to do is unscrew this, and now I can just slide this off. So you really just want to, like, oh, spatula that from the side. It's incredibly detailed. We've got some bits of resin stuck to it. So I'm just gonna do my best to scrape those off. All right, and then we'll put this back on over here. I think we're ready to start our next print job. So it's done importing. Now I can unplug this flash drive. It only keeps one print job loaded up on the printer at a time. So two hours and 30 minutes. That's an extremely fast print. All right, so we've got our half gallon of isopropyl alcohol in the wash and cure station. So I'm just going to hit start, and it's just going to agitate this isopropyl and stir it around to dissolve any residual resin left on that print. It's finished with its wash cycle, so I can go ahead and take this out, and then we'll pull it out of the isoalcohol bath. We'll drip as much back into the container as we can. All right, so now we just go through the somewhat tedious process of snapping off all of these support materials. Should be nice and crunchy. It's pretty sharp and it could actually cut through these gloves. I bought a pair of tougher, thicker gloves. So I think I'm going to use these for the uh, support removal step. I think I did a pretty good job. We'll put that on. We'll do one more rinse. Now it's time to cure this thing. I'm going to switch modes from wash to cure. We'll put the protective lid on here. And hit start. And that's just blasting this model with UV light from all directions to try and cure up any uncured resin. Well, it looks pretty good to me. In the meantime, we've got this other print going, and it's already a quarter done. These printers go fast. It smells kind of like a Sharpie or dry erase marker in this room now. That's just the isopropyl alcohol and maybe some of this resin. We've got our fan turned back on and that should help clear all of the smell out of this room. And uh, there's all my little Master Chiefs and some aliens there, so we'll be cleaning those off shortly. All right, so it's the next day. I let this print finish and just kind of sit here overnight. So let's take a look at it. I really like this lid. It's super convenient. If you only have one clean hand with this one, you can easily do the lid. But with this, you have to use both hands. So if you got like resin on your fingers or something, you're gonna get this thing all dirty. Something like this is much preferred. And actually, I think Creality should come out with a wash and rinse station that has the same style of lid because I like it so much. But let's deplate these parts. So we'll take this off here. Now, interestingly enough, we had some issues on the support material here. Right there you can see the support material broke away, but it was able to build itself out and re-establish a connection to the part and pretty much finish this without any issues. Over here you can see the same thing, it kind of broke off, but I'm pretty surprised how robust the support systems are on these prints. Overall, I think everything on this plate turned out really nice. You can see all these little name plates that I made. Um, I want to start labeling things. Someone in the comments was telling me that I should use a plastic spatula to take these parts off. I'm not sure if that'll work. Oh, wow, it is. It works. Okay, well, that's what I like about the comments section. There's a lot of people in there that can really help me out. 
Yeah, that works a lot better. Thank you, person in the comments section. Now when I do this demolding, I actually like to angle it away from myself. And that way, oh, I just tore a glove. I'd say you probably go through 50 to 100 gloves for every bottle of resin that you use up. So just add that to the cost when you're considering, you know, how many bottles of resin you want to go through. This uh, spatula sat in the resin overnight and it actually degraded the material and it's kind of falling apart. So I'll have to get rid of this spatula. We're going back to the metal spatula for now. All right, so now I'm rinsing the last batch of parts and I'm gonna change into my orange gloves. With parts with a flat surface that all the supports are attached to, I find it's pretty easy to just take the spatula and just sever them. Just like that. Pretty quick and easy. Also with these pre-supported models, the designer usually puts some care into making sure that they're easy to detach. So if you get some good models, it really saves you a lot of time. I mean, just watch this. I can just crack this off. There goes half the supports. There goes the other half of the supports. Now at this point, if we want to empty the resin tank, I can just hit the out button and the pump will just suck up all the resin out of there and put it back into the bottle. I'm gonna dry off these parts. There's a little bit of alcohol left on them. So I'm just gonna use this ducted fan. All right, so let's switch this over to cure. We'll turn it to normal speed, hit go, and we'll let it run. Something you can do to make sure you're not contaminating your clothes with resin and carrying that into your house is to just go on a nice walk outside, get in the sun, and make sure any of that resin that may have gotten on your clothes is getting cured by the UV light from the sun. I know those in the 3D printing community don't often go outside, but it's worth taking a step outside of your basement to go enjoy the great outdoors. You can see here's all my resin contaminated goods. I just have them in a clear plastic bag, so they've just been kind of baking out here in the sun, and they should be cured for the most part. Also, any gloves or tools that we want to reuse later, we can cure, and I'll actually turn these inside out so that if any resin got on the inside, that's gonna get cured too. So here's all the prints that I came up with over the course of the last 24 hours. I think they look awesome. I mean, the amount of detail you can get on these prints is simply unsurpassed by FDM printers. Just look at these little alien dudes. We got the, uh, the X-Wing over there. We got all these Master Chiefs. And uh, these little name tags are pretty cool too. So I'll be putting those on my printers. Just little markers. But, I mean, these are tiny little guys here. And just the amount of detail is crazy. Like, especially this one. This one turned out looking awesome. But look how small it is. There's my finger. Tons of detail on those models. They look really good. I really like this 8K resolution for this screen size. And then we've got this larger model here. Really nice details. You can see the texture on the individual parts of that model. It's got chainmail in some places and smooth armor in others. And the printer can reproduce those textures just based on the super fine resolution that it has. And this little ship here, I think it's called an X-Wing. So this opens a lot of doors in terms of what you can 3D print. So much cool stuff can be made with a resin 3D printer. So after playing around with this Halot Mage Pro for about 24 hours, I got three successful prints off of it. I didn't have any failed prints, it was all successful. And I really got familiar with the resin 3D printing process. Now I know there's a lot I can do to learn more and master this craft, but for now, this is what I've got. And it's pretty impressive. I mean, going from basically no practical knowledge with resin 3D prints to producing a full tray of parts and uh, learning how to use the slicer and everything, it was a really simple experience. I just went with the stock profiles and started printing stuff and it all came out great. Some of the features that I really enjoyed on this Halot Mage Pro were this one-handed easy lift lid. This little pump in the back of the machine made it so that I didn't have to pour the resin, which is an easy place to make mistakes and make a mess. 
So not having to deal with that made this printer even easier to use. There was that little issue of not removing the foam and kind of crashing the printer into the bottom of the, the build area. But fortunately I was able to fix it so it wasn't too big of a problem. Overall I have a lot of experience with 3D printing but that's all in FDM. Transitioning that knowledge over to resin was super simple and if you already have an FDM printer then I think picking up a resin printer wouldn't be a bad idea. The Creality Halot Mage is one of the best offerings in its price range. The build volume on this machine was awesome. Having a large build volume on a resin printer is exceptionally cool just because of the way that print speed scales on these machines. If you look at an FDM printer, if you want to print a single Benchy on here, it takes a certain amount of time, let's just say 40 minutes. And if you want to print 10 Benchies, then it'll take you 10 times longer. However, on a resin printer, the overall print time is unaffected by the number of instances on the plate. If you wanted to print a single Benchy, it might take an hour and a half. But if you wanted to put 20 Benchies on this one plate, then that would still take an hour and a half. You'd just use up more material and have more parts in the end. So in that way, resin printers are excellent at scaling up because one machine can produce 20 times as many parts without taking any additional time. So that's one of the reasons why I think having a large print area on a resin 3D printer is exceptionally useful. Now a big difference between using a resin 3D printer and an FDM 3D printer are the consumables. On an FDM 3D printer, you virtually have no consumables except for the filament. You just buy more filament and you print more parts. Occasionally you might need to replace a print surface or a nozzle, but if you've got everything tuned properly and you just run in your machines, you really shouldn't need to replace anything other than your spool of filament. Compare that to the resin 3D printing process. I went through about 30 gloves in the process of using half of that bottle of resin, which adds to the cost of running the machine. Now, as I get more experienced and I'm more careful, I won't have to contaminate quite so many gloves, but it's still a major consumable cost. Also, you'll be going through paper towels and rubbing alcohol and plastic bags to contain all the mess that you make. So you end up with a lot of additional costs with running this machine. On top of that, when you're printing these models out, you end up having to use support material pretty much 100% of the time. Every part that you print is gonna need at least a little bit of support material, and you might be using as much as 50% of your resin just in that support material. So it might sound like you're getting a good deal buying two liters of resin for 20 bucks, so you have to basically discard 50% of the resin, and you'll end up with some of the resin stuck to your parts that gets rinsed off into the tank here, or it ends up getting everywhere and kind of just getting wasted. So it's not a 100% efficient process, whereas with a well-designed FDM model that has a certain print orientation and can be printed without any support, you end up with 100% of the material uh, being turned into useful parts in the end. Also, you don't have to worry about all those additional consumables when you're running an FDM printer. So in the end, I think running an FDM printer is less expensive. Also, you gotta look at the space that this thing takes up. I mean, sure, the printer is pretty small. It only takes up about a square foot of desk space but you need another couple square feet for cleanup, another couple square feet for this wash and cure station. You need additional storage space for all of your materials that you're gonna need. I mean, I've got this pretty large desk here. It's like a six by two and a half foot desk and it's completely filled up with stuff and I feel like I could use even a little bit more space than this. Ideally, I'd have a paint booth set up where it's just like a tent where you've got three or four walls containing you in there for removing support material and maybe painting these things after the fact. Now support material ends up going everywhere. You're scraping them off and they just go flying. So uh, it's really hard to contain that mess. Even if you end up using support material on an FDM print, it's usually pretty easy to clean up and you don't have to worry about the pieces of support material flying away and being potential little toxic resin sources around your house. With FDM printers, you break it apart and it's just like, you know, inert plastic. So you really don't have much to worry about with it versus with this resin, everything's kind of messy and I'd like to have better control and containment over the materials. So after you buy the printer, if you wanna have a proper wash and cure station and all of the extra materials that you'll need, plan on investing about 200 additional dollars. Also that FEP material or FEP, it's that clear plastic coating on the bottom of the vat. That is kind of a disposable item that you have to replace occasionally. They say after every about 200 hours, you're gonna to need to replace that. That thing's going through a lot of stress. It's getting a lot of UV light exposure, which is not good for plastics. And also every time you're pulling the plastic off of the surface of that FEP for those particularly sticky layers, 
you hear it popping off, that's kind of stressful for the plastic because you're bending it and stretching it and all that kind of stuff. So you don't want it to rupture and spill resin all over your LCD screen. That would actually be pretty disastrous. Also, when I finish printing and it's got the part stuck to the tray, if I were to accidentally send that to zero and smash that down against the FEP tray and the LCD screen, you could do some pretty serious damage to this machine. So it requires you to pay attention and not mess things up. That's true of all 3D printers, but just the amount of damage that you can do from simple mishandling on this type of machine, uh, I feel like it's a little bit more sensitive and you have to be a little more careful with it. On top of that, this thing pretty much perpetually stinks. I turned the fan off for filming this short little segment, but I'm gonna turn it back on and pretty much just leave it on 24 seven to manage the constant uh, source of fumes coming out of this machine. There's no way around the resin stink other than having constant ventilation. So with all those downsides, you might be thinking, okay, why would I want to get into resin 3D printing? Well, it simply offers a level of print detail that you can't achieve with FDM. It's pretty astonishing how small the details are on this print. Uh, these kind of details would be completely lost in the layer lines on a regular FDM printer. Also, that ability to print things extremely rapidly in batches makes resin printers almost suitable for mass production. I mean, you can really crank some parts out, especially if you're doing low volume production. Also, these photo cure resins are much more resistant to high temperatures than a typical FDM print material. Take PLA, for example. If you dip a PLA part in boiling water, it'll completely turn to mush. And that's out of necessity. The material has to melt at a low enough temperature so that it's easy to liquefy it and run it through the 3D printing process. Versus these materials, they're photo cured, so having a low melting temperature isn't that important for these materials. And as such, when you cure them, they're pretty tolerant to higher temperatures. Also with a resin 3D printer, you can make extremely realistic miniatures, which is something that you can't really do as easily on a FDM 3D printer. So at the end of the day, which do you think you'd prefer? FDM or resin? For me, I have a soft spot for FDM because that's where I got my start into 3D printing, and I just appreciate how it takes up so much less space. I mean, you basically just have to have room for the machine itself and you can start printing. Versus with a resin printer, you have to have all this equipment, you have to have a ventilated room, you have to work with dangerous, flammable, and toxic chemicals. I feel like that's a big barrier to entry that you don't really have with a regular FDM printer. This is just, you know, you buy one of these, you set it in the corner and you can print with it when you want to print. When you turn it off, it's not continuing to stink like this thing. I mean, this thing's powered off, but it still smells bad because those resin fumes are constantly evaporating off of that vat. So at the end of the day, I'm glad I have access to both types of machines now. I think having a resin 3D printer is incredibly useful for certain projects. And now that I have this, I'll be able to fire it up whenever I need that capability. You definitely need a garage or an office space to have a machine like this. Versus an FDM printer, I feel much better about having something like this in the living room or around the house. I mean, you can just unplug it and it's completely inert. Versus this thing, you've, you've got to do all the sorts of cleanup. And the other thing that I'm worried about is if people aren't taking proper precautions and dealing with this resin and stinky stuff, like people might just be pouring it down the drain, for example, which I would never do because these are bad chemicals that you don't want to introduce to your community's wastewater supply. My overall message would be, if you decide to get into resin 3D printing, just be careful with it. Um, I've watched a lot of resin 3D printing content. I think a lot of people are pretty upfront when it comes to the hazards and uh, you know the downsides of resin 3D printing. But a lot of other creators just talk about how awesome 3D printers are and how awesome these resin printers are. And they don't really talk about you know, how this might be a health and safety hazard. Now I'm not saying FDM printers are this glorious safe device. I mean, I still have ventilation running whenever I have an FDM printer running because it is generating microplastics. If you can smell it, then there's something in the air and I think you should be ventilating that away. However, um, I think the safety risk is lower with an FDM printer than with a resin printer. So I'd like to know what you think. Do you think I'm overblowing the risks with running a resin 3D printer? I'm a little bit scared of this stuff, but I think you should be and make sure to treat it with respect and make sure you're not polluting or mismanaging those chemicals that you're dealing with. So thanks for watching. Let me know if you want to see more resin 3D printer content in the future. This thing will definitely be here on standby for uh, whenever we need to fire up a resin 3D print. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what you guys think about it. Now that this is over, I gotta turn the vent back on so it doesn't get stinky in here.